So unfortunately, um, or maybe fortunately, um, Andre stole most of my thunder and said about 50% of the things I was planning on saying. So some of them will be repetition and I might go faster than I would have otherwise. But you'll also hear it from a different perspective, which might be useful in more, probably a more field theory kind of perspective. Um, but also there were some questions people asked me. One of the questions that came up the most often after the first lecture was, you described something where somehow you've lost um, Lorentz invariance. And what happened to Lorentz invariance? And well, I mean, part of the answer is that if you write down a density matrix of some stuff which is at rest in some single frame, then surely at some point that frame will show up in the, in the, um, and the analysis, and so you shouldn't expect to have something which is completely Lorentz invariant in your description of a non-Lorentz invariant system. Um, but I also asked a very, very specifically non-Lorentz invariant question in the first lecture. And I want to just mention here that you can be a little bit more general with nearly the same tools. And we'll see that it works, but not as well. So let me just quickly mention that. So here's the time direction, and here's, say, the z-axis. And what I asked about in the first lecture is if I have a thermal state at rest in this coordinate system, and I ask about a correlation function between an operator here, 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 I mean, it could be several operators. Many problems, what's interested is, is one or two operators, but it could be more which are all at the same time. How do you calculate that correlation function? And what we saw is the key is that these all operate on the same the same state without any time evolution involved. So because all of my operators were operating on the state without having to put any funny time evolution in between them, the only complicated evolution operator was this one, which I could rewrite by putting it here. In terms of the Hamiltonian, and then it turned into um, this statistical function which you can expand in a path integral which gave us the formalism that we talked about. There's a light cone here. Physics gets more complicated if I ask about correlation functions between this point and a point up here in the time-like region. But actually, very similar tools to this work if I ask about correlations between an operator here and at some other points which are at different times, but space-like separated, okay? And the key is that I can draw this hypersurface, and those points are all lying on that hypersurface. Um, and this n e to the minus beta h n is a description of my density matrix on this hypersurface. But I actually know perfectly well what my density matrix is on this hypersurface, and it's a sensible question to ask because this is a Cauchy surface. You can define a state, a density matrix, on a Cauchy surface, and this is one, so I can do that. Okay. And the easiest way to do it is just to say this is a stupid choice of frame. Why don't I go to a frame where this surface is an equal time surface? Okay, so I'm going to do a Lorentz transform. To a system where this is now my z-axis and this is my time axis, which is just a boost with respect to this p 
picture. Remember, a boost is not rotating time and space. It's um, hyperbolically rotating so that these two axes squeeze in on each other. T prime. And in this frame, this series of points are here, 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 here. This distance is shorter than this distance by a gamma factor. So if this is the point um, Vz, comma Z, where this is the time component and the space component, and V is sort of the slope of this line, then this is the point 0 z over root 1 minus v squared. No, z root 1 minus v squared. So they're closer together. OK? Yeah, yeah, you know that. That's special relativity. OK? And over here, my operators are described by sum over a complete set of states. Um, my operators and a statistical function describing how I should what with what weights I should pick different states in this system which is a plasma moving past me and a plasma moving past me is described by e to the minus beta gamma e minus gamma v pz. That's the appropriate statistical factor for weighting states in a plasma which is moving past you. And you know that because this is the Lorentz transform of this. Okay? And nothing stops me from replacing this E and this PZ with their operator expressions on this N, the same as I did over there. And rewriting this as then a path integral over all fields. Um, but now, The process of building this, actually, I, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Let me write out what this thing looks like in a little more detail. Or let's just write that as trace. Trace e to the minus integral from 0 to gamma beta of t0, 0 minus v t0, z. dt prime. Well, this is a fake, this is a fake variable that I'm using to express this beta times gamma as an integral. Uh, and then all of my operators. Okay, and this is the thing that I have to expand as a density matrix. This t0, 0, that's the same as the Hamiltonian. It's the same as what was going on when we tried to expand this e. This T0z, what is that? That's a momentum density, which I then integrate over space to get the momentum. And just as T0,0 contains things like time derivatives of fields twice, T0z contains single time derivative and the single z derivative, as you know. Okay, and now here's the tricky thing. This has terms with two time derivatives and terms with no time derivatives. This has only terms with one time derivative. Okay. 
Or if you have a fermion, you remember that I had a psi bar gamma zero um, del zero psi, and this had a thing with a time index and another thing with a time index. And over here, I'm going to have things like psi bar gamma z zero derivative plus gamma zero z derivative psi with, I guess, a half or something. And so this has things with, and remember, I have to rotate this by a factor of i to get the Euclidean version. And time derivatives are going to have to get rotated with a factor of i. And here I always have an odd number, and here I always have an even number. And that means that when I turn this into a path integral, the action part of my path integral, 0 gamma beta dt prime d3x, is going to have the usual Hamiltonian, L Euclidean, plus it's going to be x of minus this thing. And here there will be an i times Euclidean time derivative of a field, z derivative of a field. There's a relative i here because this Euclidean time derivative is a factor of i shifted from the normal one. And this gives rise then to a path integral which does not have a real positive weight. So for instance, although nothing stops you from carrying out a, um, a perturbative treatment of this problem, you cannot write this on the lattice. Because to write this on the lattice, this is going to give rise to phases. And phases kill you on the lattice, which I guess is so thoroughly true that we won't even discuss it in the lattice lectures, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, so that's just a. You can do this for imaginary velocity. Um, but as you know, that's just taking your periodic boundaries. And instead of drawing your lattice like this, you instead draw your lattice like this. So you can do this for imaginary. If so, if I now make the velocity, uh, there's a factor of v here I forgot to write. And if I make the velocity imaginary, then everything is good. And it's just a rewriting of the usual vacuum problem. Um, but if you want to do this with real velocities, then what happens is that you get the same formula we had before with the sum over p zeros, except p zero is 2 pi nt over gamma minus i v p3. pz, p3, I guess I'm switching back and forth between using z and using 3 as my as my uh, field component, sorry, pz. So the frequencies in this Matsubara sum now have a complex part, which is pz dependent. OK. And you can then develop the perturbation theory, which is kind of interesting. Has a few surprises, for instance. I can still do a dimensional reduction where I keep only the zero component of this P0. Um, and then I can do some contour rotation that makes this disappear. And the three-dimensional theory is exactly the same as the three-dimensional theory for this original guy, strangely enough. OK. And for details, you should see The paper of uh, Caron Yule, 0811.1603. And the history of this paper, he was my student at the time. And he hid for two months, and I didn't see him at all. And I wondered what he was up to if he was actually doing anything. And I went and I sought him down and said, so it's been a while since we talked. And he said, yeah, sorry about that. I've been working on something. And then he revealed this whole thing to me, which was finished. 
Um, so not only am I not an author, but I actually had nothing to say or do about that whole work. Um, I highly recommend this to students if you're good enough. <laughs> okay. Um, your advisor, well, no, actually I don't. Tell your advisor what you're working on. Okay. Okay, so that's an aside. You can calculate correlation functions going right just almost up to the light cone by techniques which are very similar to what we already saw. Um, but you end up with a kind of weird twisted perturbation theory at the end. And there is no lattice approach to treating this problem for real velocity. Okay. So that's an aside. So now I want to talk about hydrodynamics because we did a lot of work to understand the equilibrium equal time correlation functions, which means enough to learn about the thermodynamics of our system in equilibrium. And then everything we care, so we, 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 we have learned thermal in flat, non-expanding space. And then you want to go off and do cosmology where your space is expanding. And you want to go off and do maybe, I don't know, heavy ion collisions where your system is small. Or you want to study perturbations where your system is not everywhere exactly the same and at the same temperature as everywhere else. It's doing stuff. And so you might have a system where here it's really hot, and here it's cooler, and here it's moving in this direction, and here it's moving in some other direction. And now you say, this is very far from an equilibrium system because the temperature here and here might be different by a factor of two and the velocities here might be different by a relativistic amount. And so on the face of it, everything we learned is useless. Okay, so that would be the most pessimistic interpretation. Okay, and then the most optimistic interpretation is, no, it's not useless. It's just that Over here, I'm described by one temperature and one velocity. And over here, I'm described by another temperature and another velocity. And over here, some third temperature and some third velocity. And here, some fourth temperature and some fourth velocity. And that's OK. I can completely describe what's happening here, what's happening here, what's happening here, what's happening here, each in terms of their own little, hydro uh, their own little thermal region doing its own thermal thing. And that's pretty close to true. Um, and hydrodynamics is trying to figure out, A, how do you study that as a big system? What do these guys then do to each other? And B, what are the corrections to their each living in their own, their own separate little lives? OK. And the whole game is going to be that no matter what, no matter how complicated, fast varying, non-equilibrium anything my system is, it always obeys a few basic rules. And one of them is that stress energy is covariantly conserved. It's true in curved space. It's true. It's hot outside. It's hotter than in here. It's just, I don't know what we should do about that. <laughs> For me, it's something like this. You're from Spain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the problem is I don't think that the circulation system brings enough fresh air into this room. That's right. And the alternative, which is opening the windows, brings in 39 degree <laughs> air, which um, it's sort of Scylla and Charybdis or something. Um, it's a problem you <laughs> <laughs> So in theories, in theories with conserved, cur uh, conserved charges, you also then have the covariant conservation <laughs> of 
of a current associated to each charge. Um, I'll mostly concentrate on this issue. And at lowest order, ideal hydrodynamics is to assume that T mu nu and J mu have their local equilibrium form. As you've, I guess, already seen, I'm now repeating other people, but I'm setting it up for what I wanted to say. Um, and T mu nu and J nu, J mu are uncomfortable variables to work in terms of. In particular, this is four equations. It's important to count equations. This is four equations. This is one equation. This is 10 values. This is four values. So, so far I don't have enough information. And the additional information I want is the fact that this is going to have its equilibrium form. And so I want to write down what that equilibrium form is. Uh, and the first sort of hint is that T mu nu is a real symmetric 4 by 4 matrix. And that means that it has an eigenvalue, eigenvector problem which you can solve. It's going to have orthogonal, or I guess since it's, we're in Minkowski, it's the Minkowski orthogonality um, set of eigenvectors, each with their own eigenvalue. And one of those will be a time-like eigenvector, and the other three will be space-like eigenvectors. So it should have one time-like eigenvector, and that I'll name u mu, and I'll normalize it so that u mu u mu is minus one. Remember, I am in the space positive uh, metric inventions. And the fact that this is an eigenvalue, sorry, an eigenvector, it has an eigenvalue, and so I can write that t mu nu u nu is epsilon u mu, u nu, u mu, where this is the eigenvalue of u mu. And in equilibrium, I recognize that, that so this is a statement which has nothing to do with equilibrium. It's all, you can always do this. And if I'm in equilibrium, I recognize this as my rest frame four vector and this as my uh, energy density. And I'm going to take the landau lifshitz frame where I choose as variables epsilon and u mu using this definition in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay. And this I think of then is my rest frame energy density. And this is my rest frame for velocity. Or this is the four vector which defines what my rest frame should be. Okay? And that's four numbers. This is a four vector, but it has a condition on it. So it's three independent quantities. And this is one quantity, so that's four. Okay? Which is the same as the number of equations I have. And so if I postulate that T mu nu takes its equilibrium form, which is T mu nu is E plus P u mu u nu plus P G mu nu. In the rest frame, this is one zero zero zero. And this is minus one, 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 one. So these components have to be each be the pressure. And because I use g mu nu, I get an extra minus one here, so I have to put an extra p here. This quantity is called the enthalpy, as you know. 
and P if I have an equation of state, which is exactly what having solved thermodynamics gives me, then I can express P as a function of the energy density and any um, number densities which may be there. Or equivalently in terms of the temperature and chemical potentials. So these are dual sets of variables. If you know one, you know the other. And similarly, in equilibrium, J mu should be U mu times N, where N is the density. In equilibrium, this would be true. In equilibrium, this would be true. Equation of state says I know P in terms of the other things. This is one equation per A. One variable per A, this is four variables, and that matches my four equations in one equation per A. And so this is a closed set of equations. And so if you assume that the current and stress tensor take their equilibrium form, and that's important, this is an assumption, Then I get a set of equations which close. These are sufficient to determine the evolution of this guy, this guy, and this guy. And then I can determine the complete space-time development of such a system. Okay, and that's ideal hydrodynamics. Um, and I use that dirty word, assume. Okay, my high school friend John Haller always liked to say, you know what happens when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. <laughs> okay, so we should, sorry. <laughs> um, So the natural thing is to ask, are these assumptions OK? And I'm going to start with the hand wavy estimate, um, which is to introduce the Knudsen number. Which is defined as the ratio of This is some microscopic length scale. Usually you say it's the mean free path I'm not completely happy with that description. Mean free path means if I have a bunch of particles, how far does a particle fly before it hits something? There's two things I'm unhappy about. Hitting something might not be sufficient. If when you hit something, you change by some very small angle, that hasn't really changed what you're doing. So there's a so-called transport mean free path, which is where you weight a collision with um, one minus the cosine of the angle change. And that's sort of a more realistic estimate here. But I used that dirty word particle. And in an interacting theory, it's not obvious that you have particles. If it's a weakly couple, you can argue that there are quasi-particles, that there are things which live long enough and propagate far enough that you can think of them as being like particles. If you have, say, QCD at a few hundred MeV temperature, it's by no means obvious to me that there's any useful sense in which there are particles in that system. It's just some gray goo or something. Mm, I guess extremely ultraviolet glue technically. Gamma ray colored glue. Goo. And so this means some kind of microscopic length or time scale over which your system can um, 
modify itself and equilibrate. And this is uh, the sort of system size or fluctuation size. So here I want to be, and this is vague, and it needs to be vague because you want to have one description for some huge range of systems. This is the length scale over which your system is changing from being hot to cold. Or the other thing that can happen is that your system's temperature changes only very, very little, but goes back and forth. And then what we're talking about is some kind of a wavelength of that inhomogeneity in the system, if that inhom inhomogeneity is the thing that you're trying to understand. And so this length scale could depend on what you're trying to understand. If you're trying to understand a big system with little but short wavelength ripples in it, then to understand the big system, you might have a very small Knudsen number. And to understand the little ripples, you might have a larger Knudsen number. And the usual story is that if Knudsen is small compared to 1, then it's all good. If it's larger than of order 1, give up. And if it's a little smaller than 1, like 1 third, then work harder. In some cases, depending on how persnickety, how accurate you want to be, how, how picky you are, even if it's small, you might still want to work harder. And that's what I want to describe. Okay. And in doing so, we will get kind of a cleaner or better definition of what we really mean by this Knudsen number. And we'll also learn about the target of what it is that we want to investigate, which has already been stolen from me. It'll be the vis viscosities. That's the primary thing we'll be interested in. Okay. So this should sound a lot like things you heard yesterday, but that's okay because repetition is good. Um, where am I? So can I ask, am I? Yes. Is this number somehow related to Reynolds number? Or? It's related to Reynolds number. Reynolds' number differs by this, that it also involves the typical velocities of flow divided by the speed of sound. Okay, so... The, the, the viscosity is already hidden in here. This is the ratio of the, of the viscous length to the system length. And the Reynolds number has an additional factor of velocity over speed of sound. So that, for instance, if I have water running through a pipe and I run that water at a low velocity, then the Reynolds number behaves itself. I think Reynolds number is inverse of, inverse of this times V over speed of sound. So if I run my water slowly, then the Reynolds number is small, which means things are well behaved. And this number is small, which means that hydro works. And then if I run my water fast, then the Reynolds number becomes large, which means that you will develop turbulent behavior. And this remains small until you try to follow the turbulence. And then it'll go to tiny little turbulent eddies, which will bring a shorter scale in here. And so the final resolution of what happens to those eddies might occur somewhere where the Knudsen number is no longer so small. Okay. So they're, they're related. So this is the issue. Is hydrodynamics well defined? It's related to the issue of the Reynolds number. But the Reynolds number throws in a little extra information, which gives you information about whether turbulence will develop. Okay. Okay. So, if this Knudsen number is small compared to 1, then this is at least a good starting place. And you can ask what should happen after that. And fortunately, the hard work has been done for me. Um, T mu nu, more generally, would be E plus P U mu, U nu plus P G mu nu plus some extra piece. 
And because I use this four vector and as a definition for u and epsilon, even when I'm not in equilibrium, this is purely spatial. And I can use some reparameterization freedom to move it into a relatively simple form. And the point is going to be that if my system is pretty uniform, then gradients are small. This ratio is the statement that if I write a gradient, it will give me something which is subdominant. And so this delta t mu nu should have some expansion in derivatives of u mu um, n and epsilon. And we can use our freedoms to eliminate those ones and write it only in terms of variations of u. And I can do all the same things for j mu. And this should have an expansion in derivatives of n. And I can eliminate the derivatives of the other things in expressing delta j. And I can eliminate the derivatives of these things in expressing delta t mu nu. Okay, I will concentrate on delta t mu nu. This is important if you have non-vanishing conserved charges. You need to keep track of it. Uh, if you don't, then you don't. If those are small, if you have non-vanishing but small conserved charges, um, then this might not back react very much on your t mu nu. And then you can get away with treating this by itself. Okay, if, you're, if your charge densities are large, then you have to really solve a coupled system. And I should just mention that other things can happen, like you have um, gauge singlet scalar fields or magnetic fields or other large scale gauge singlet things which could be running around and you would then have to add these to the equations and they become more complicated. But I will not discuss those cases. Today, instead, we start with just what this delta t mu nu could possibly look like at the one derivative level. It can only depend on derivatives of the flow four vector. Um, because of this condition, the derivatives of the four, four vector are of spatial derivatives of the spatial four vector. And so this is a, a rank two spatial tensor, okay? A rank two tensor can be decomposed in a symmetric traceless part an anti-symmetric part, which you can think of as a pseudo vector, and a uh, pure trace or scalar part. And the pseudo vector part, if I have here a symmetric tensor, the pseudo vector part can't contribute to it at leading order. And so you only need the other two pieces, del mu u nu plus del nu u mu minus two thirds um, g mu nu del dot u. This isn't quite right. It, there's a plus u u here. This is the, the triangle which you wrote in the previous lecture. Um, so that's one thing that could happen. And the other thing that could happen is this triangle mu nu times del dot u. This is the traceless, this is the pure trace and this is the traceless part. And we give them coefficients because I don't know better, which I'll call eta and zeta. They are presumably functions of temperature and chemical potential, or if you prefer, energy density and number densities. And I write them with minus signs because it turns out that this has, th with the minus signs there, these have to be positive. And essentially, they have to be positive to have a, a stable system. And I'll explain that a little bit better now because I'm going to explain 
I always find it's useful of these things to have a physical picture of what this means. And so I'm going to try to provide you a cartoon physical picture of how to think about these guys. Okay. So Yeah, we saw that yesterday, but some people were on vacation. Delta mu nu is g mu nu plus u mu u nu. This is a, um, a projector to the spatial directions of the local rest frame. So often, rather than writing it in this covariant way, people will write this directly in the local rest frame in term with i's and j's, and then you don't need this then this is just del i u j. So, so if I do that, if I adopt for the moment the local rest frame, then we're talking, for instance, about what if del x u y is the same as del y u x, or what if del x u y is minus del y u x, so that del x u y plus del y u x is non-zero. This is the term which is appearing in the shear viscosity. And if they're opposite, then del x u y minus del y u x, which I can call omega z, little omega, is non-zero. This is the vorticity. So this is the shear flow. This is the vorticity. And then the last thing you could have is that del x u x is del y u y is del z u z. I want to draw a picture of each one of these so we have sort of a good physical intuition of what's going on. Here's the point where I pick my fluid to be at rest. This means that if I look in this direction, the fluid is flowing in. In this direction, the fluid is flowing out. And here the fluid is flowing like so. So along one direction is flowing in and then is going out along this direction. Okay? Under such a pattern, you do not expect this point to be in equilibrium. It's getting squeezed in one direction and stretched in the other. Instead, what I expect is that at this point, the fluid is going to push back this way. Well, I mean, it has a positive pressure. Systems, stable systems have positive pressure. So it's actually pushing out in every direction. But I expect it to push out harder in the direction it's getting squeezed and push out softer in the direction that it's getting stretched. Okay. If that's not the case, if it pushes out harder in this direction and weaker in this direction, then it will make that flow get bigger. Okay, it's going to, the pushing out in this direction is helping the flow, the pushing out in this direction is hurting the flow, and so if this is stronger, then the flow gets stronger. So the, the pressure pattern should be the opposite of the flow pattern. And that's why you need a minus sign here. It's just to make this, a, it's that the fluid should resist getting sheared instead of encouraging shearing and making it get stronger and stronger. Okay? And the ratio of delta pressure over um, del u is the shear viscosity. So the shear viscosity is precisely how much harder the fluid is, how hard the fluid is resisting this flow pattern divided by the strength of the flow pattern. Obviously, if I make the flow pattern reduced to zero, then the pressure should be uniform. So I need to take a ratio. And that's, the, that's what the shear viscosity, um, with the minus.
That's what the shear viscosity is. What's vorticity? Here's a point which is at rest. Del x u y, let's say, is positive. That means that as I go in the x direction, u y is getting bigger. But del y u x is negative, so as I go in the y direction, I'm moving in the minus x direction. So that's a flow like this. Shut up. Now you see why that's called vorticity. It's just the fluid spinning. Okay. Um, the pressure has no idea how to react to that, so it doesn't. At next to leading order, the pressure could be stronger in this plane and weaker out of this plane. Or it could be stronger out of this plane and weaker in this plane. Actually, different systems have that effect with opposite coefficients. So that's perfectly okay. Um, but at linear order in this pattern, there's no reason the pressure should do something. In fact, it wouldn't know how because this is a pseudo vector and the stress tensor is a symmetric tensor. And you can't make a symmetric tensor proportional to a pseudo vector. That doesn't work. So this has no effect. And this, you know what this is. This is. classic um, divergent flow. Divergent flow. If that divergent flow is positive, so if the fluid is trying to escape, then the pressure pushing it out should be weaker than normal. So that it's not feeding that expansion. And if instead the fluid is flowing in, then the pressure resisting should be bigger to fight against the compression. If you do that with the opposite sign, you again get an unstable system, which when it's expanding, wants to expand harder, and when it's compressing, wants to compress harder. And that's crazy. Okay? And so that's what this is all about. Um, is that <coughs> clear? So what's the name for that? Uh, divergent, divergent flow. Yeah, but for the coefficient. Bulk the viscosity. The Sorry. <laughs> Some people call it second viscosity because they want to confuse you. I guess it really ought to be called divergent viscosity, or that that sounds like it's divergent. Um, I don't know. So it's called bulk viscosity. It's because it's what happens when you're changing the volume. Sometimes it's called volume viscosity. That's a good term. Because this is what happens when you're changing the volume of the system. So this is a resistance in a system to having its volume changed. OK. Oh, just out of curiosity, do people know? No, no, I won't get distracted. Just, I spend enough of my time distracted. OK. Uh, how big are these things? Um, and I think you already talked about this a little. I don't know. Did Not you? Numbers. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave that there for a moment. So. Yeah, I'll make a few remarks about these things. Supposing I'm at weak coupling. Naively, you would say if you're at weak coupling, the viscosity should get small. And that's precisely backwards. At weak coupling, the viscosity is of order um, E plus P divided by alpha squared t. 
Where did that come from? E plus P is because it wants to compete with this. It wants to be, you know, the natural size for T is E plus P. Okay. And this alpha squared T is or 1 over alpha squared t is the length scale that it takes for your system or the time scale that it takes for your system to equilibrate. So the longer it takes for your system to equilibrate, the, the longer there is for this region getting squeezed and pushed to, um, to leave equilibrium and look less and less like an equilibrium system. A weakly coupled system is a system which takes a long time to relax to equilibrium. And so um, the time scale it takes to relax to equilibrium should show up here. And another way of thinking about that is I have a gradient here, and so this thing should be proportional to 1 over a gradient or a length. And the only length scale is sort of the length of a free path or the time scale of relaxation, and that's what I've put in here. Okay, And this is true up to logs. Plus there's logs. The bulk viscosity is similar except there's something funny that happens. Mm -hmm. If you have a theory which is conformal if it looks the same at different scales, then if you compress it, it doesn't even know it's been compressed. It has no idea. Okay. Furthermore, if it's close to conformal, then you compress it and it knows, but it doesn't really care very much. And so it goes a little ways out of equilibrium. And then being out of equilibrium doesn't really change its pressure very much because it's almost conformal. If it were conformal, the energy density tells you the pressure, period. And so there's one power of the conformal conformality breaking from it's not leaving equilibrium. And there's a second power from this pressure not caring if it leaves equilibrium. And it's generically second order in the breaking of conformality, which is, for instance, for QCD, you have here a factor of alpha squared squared plus m over t to the fourth. If the breaking of conformality is because of the running of the coupling, then it goes to alpha squared. If it's because of quarks having masses, if those masses are small compared to the temperature, then it's this. This is for a light quark. Okay. So the bulk viscosity for some systems is dramatically smaller than the shear viscosity. Not all systems. For instance, the air has a drastically larger bulk than shear viscosity for kind of weird reasons that we won't talk about today. You can bug me about that over, over um, coffee break. But otherwise, I won't talk about it. OK. I'm going to leave this because I'm about to come back to it. We don't need this divergent flow anymore. I just want to make a remark. Did you talk about sound waves and shear waves? No. no. Did, did anyone yet talk about sound waves and shear waves? No, OK. So I'll just say a few quick remarks. Um, we can look for disturbances in our system. So supposing I have a system which is uniform at lowest order, but not quite. It has little ripples going on in it. OK. So these ripples are delta E over E, which is small compared to 1, delta U, which is small compared to 1. So small. But maybe, in some cases, important disturbances. For instance, in cosmology, such disturbances are a big deal. And their behavior is responsible for the complex angular pattern of the microwave sky. 
um, and has a lot to do with structure formation and things like that. So such things are important. And they'll have some characteristic um, Instead of writing it as lambda, because lambda is something else, I'm going to write this as 2 pi over k. k is the wave number, which is going to characterize such a wave. So there are four freedoms. So let's choose k to be magnitude k times a normal vector in the, e in the z direction, just to, to be specific. Then I can have ux, uy, u, z, and e as four variables. And it turns out, and maybe it's not too surprising, these two transverse each are independent. They each give their own fluctuations, which do their own thing. These two mix. These are longitudinal, and they mix. And that shouldn't surprise anyone, because if I have if this is my z-axis, and if here my wave has the fluid moving in this direction, and here it's moving in this direction, you can see that this region is getting compressed. So its energy density will go up. OK, so these two mix. OK? And these give rise to two shear modes. And these give rise to two sound modes. So what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to write down such a perturbation, insert it into T, and then apply del mu T mu nu equals zero, and find its dispersion. Okay, and I'll just tell you the answer. The shear modes have a frequency which is i shear over e plus p k squared. And the sound modes have speed of sound times k plus or minus speed of sound times k plus i times 4 thirds shear plus bulk over e plus p k squared. I means decaying. So this wave dies away with time. Same with these waves. These waves also propagate. This is a non-propagating wave. It sits there. The fluid flows, but the pattern sits there and decays with time. Um, that's the pattern where, as you go in this direction, it's alternating between plus and minus, and the fluid is flowing this way. So it's this fluid flowing this way, and this fluid flowing this way. And that's exactly a shear flow, which is why only the shear viscosity matters here. And it decays away with time. In the sound mode, that's when here the fluid is moving this way, and here it's moving this way. And then they compress this region, which pushes them back. So then they push the other direction, and they bounce back as some standing wave. And that's why it has to have a finite oscillating frequency. And Cs is, what is it? It's the thing it always is. It's partial p, partial e. So, um, no, that's Cs squared, right? Yeah. The usual speed of sound. So. How does this decay rate compare to the wavelength of my disturbance? Well, I can write a ratio. Here, I'm going to wipe this quickly. I can write a ratio, omega shear over k is sort of how slowly something damps, damps. That's the same thing as whether eta matters. If this is small, if this, ratio, if, this, if this ratio is small, then this wave is very persistent, or this sound wave 
oscillates many, many times before it damps away. That's precisely the region where hydrodynamics is working. Okay, and ah, yeah, everything is good. Okay, and now I put in this number. So this is then eta over E plus P divided by one over K. I should put a little M here. See, damping imaginary part, which is relevant. Okay, this is a one over K because omega shear has a K squared and I decided to put it downstairs. Okay, just for fun. Okay, this is a property of your medium. This is a property of what disturbance you decided to talk about. So this is a, is a literal, precise rendition of this hand wavy approximate Knudsen number. What we mean when we talk about a free path is really eta over E plus P. And what we mean when we talk about a characteristic length scale is one over K the wavelength up to factors of 2 pi of the disturbance that I'm interested in, okay? And so even for systems where there aren't particles and it's somehow gooey stuff, you can still define this quantity in terms of the viscosity, okay? As a remark, we saw a moment ago so eta over E plus P has units of one over energy. Why? Well, essentially because there's a gradient here. So the natural expectation is that it's something like one over T. What I just told you is that weak coupling, it's one over alpha squared T. The question is, how big could it be if you were at strong coupling? And there's a sort of a reasonable expectation that, well, it could be one over T, but it can't possibly be one, um, one over 100 T. That would be crazy. That would be saying that your system can thermalize on a scale that's tiny compared to the thermal scale. That would be really weird. And if you'd asked me, I don't know, 18 years ago, how big I thought that this could be, I would say, well, something like 1 over 0.5 T or something maybe. But then, you know, smarter people pointed out that it's actually 1 over t over 4 pi. That it can be smaller than the thermal scale by sort of 2 pi type factors. Specifically, 4 pi. Okay, which is, I guess, it's a little smaller than I would have expected, but that seems to be. And people have talked about counterexamples where it's even smaller, but I don't know if I should believe them. No, it's, it's all uh, abstract. So okay. So there's no UV complete. Um, there is no there is no system uh, with Lagrangian for which you can say that. It okay. Good. But I'll leave further remarks in that direction to um, to someone else's lectures. Are you going to talk about that? Yeah. Good. Then I don't have to. <laughs> okay. So hopefully this convinces you that these quantities, eta and zeta, are important and that we should figure out what they are, okay? Um, so now I'm going to tell you, although I guess you actually again stole my thunder, about how to go about calculating them. And the purpose is to realize that the thermodynamics we talked about in the first two lectures is not enough 
and that there are interesting questions we should be asking about equilibrium but unequal time correlation functions. This is a non-equilibrium quantity. It happens when you have a system which is not in equilibrium. Nevertheless, I'll show you, you can calculate it from equilibrium but unequal time correlation functions. So let's do that. So I'm going to start out by erasing and then immediately writing what was here. Yeah. yeah. For baryonic uh, oscillation during CME, can you keep talking about shear viscosity? Like, does this quantity make sense for baryonic matter during CME? Ah, CME? sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll remark on that in just a second. So this is the quantity we're going to be interested in. Now, I forgot to mention if I have currents, besides the equilibrium part, they also have an extra term which can appear here. They can have additional currents owing to the spatial inhomogeneity of the number densities. And in general, this can be a matrix relation. So an inhomogeneity in one current can give, in one number density can give rise to a different current in, in general, okay? This is another set of things that you could go about trying to calculate, okay? And if you have a system which has significant uh, conserved number densities, then it's important to compute these, and it's important to include the end dependences of the viscosity. Okay? And having said that it's important, I will now ignore it for the rest of the lecture, because I think we can't do everything. Okay. This is a good, good question. Okay, so my goal is to figure out what this is. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, so I want to express that in terms of something involving an equilibrium system. If I want to express it in terms of something involving an equilibrium system, then I had better start out at time equals zero, say, in equilibrium. at temperature beta in flat space. G mu nu is eta mu nu. Okay. Now, normally, if I start out in equilibrium, then I will stay in equilibrium. And so I won't learn anything. But by being sufficiently mentally flexible, I can trick my system into leaving equilibrium by generating this flow, by taking my space time, my space and stretching it so that the fluid is forced to flow in this pattern. Okay, I can do that by considering my system in an external background metric g mu nu is a to mu nu plus h mu nu, a small perturbation and I just choose my perturbation so that it will force my fluid to flow in this pattern. And then I can ask, okay, now that it's flowing, how big is the extra contribution to T? In particular, I'm going to take HXY to be non-zero, and I'm going to take it to be non-zero in a uniform, spatially uniform way. I, 
I'm going to have to make it a time-dependent but spatially uniform non-vanishing thing. And then in that background, I'm going to try to calculate Txy. Okay? And I'm going to do that twice. I'm going to do it once using the theory of hydrodynamics. And I'm going to do it once using the theory of quantum field theory. And then I'm going to equate the answers and call it a matching calculation in which I determine the coefficients of an infrared effective theory, namely hydrodynamics, in terms of its underlying theory, namely quantum field theory. And here I should pause just a moment to emphasize that the right way of thinking about this hydrodynamics is a very infrared effective field theory. So infrared that the only degrees of freedom left are degrees of freedom associated with conserved quantities. And the conserved quantities we have are the four components of energy momentum and any additional conserved charge densities. And those are precisely the degrees of freedom living in this theory. Okay. So first let me calculate. Stop it. So I hand this situation, an equilibrium system disturbed by a space, by a time varying metric perturbation. And I hand that to a hydro theorist. So the first thing I do is I apply del mu t mu nu equals zero to the equilibrium form of t mu nu to find the lowest order u mu of h. So this is determining what at lowest order is the disturbance given rise to by h. Okay, and what I find, and it's not super hard, but I'll skip the details. So the first thing I have to do is I have to calculate all of my um, Christoffel symbols, and I have to remember this is a covariant derivative, and I have to apply this form, and I have to um, do a little evolution, and what I find is that ui of x and t is zero. Okay. However, note the Christoffel symbols, for instance, this one, are not zero. And so despite u, x, u, y, u, z all being zero, I nevertheless have that the covariant gradient of Uy is not zero. In particular, because of this Christoffel symbol, grad x Uy plus grad y Ux is the time derivative of hxy. And here, I guess I'm being a little bit sloppy. I really mean the upper indices here, and I really mean the lower indices here. And so I've, I've, the statement is correct in the specific metric I have chosen, but was not a terribly covariant way of writing it. I apologize. Okay. And that means The txy is expected, well, from here, I expect it to be, ah, this is interesting. g upper xy is not zero. It's minus h lower xy. Okay. So I will get a contribution from here. I will not from here because u has no spatial components. 
but G has off-diagonal components. And so TXY is minus P HXY, and then from there, minus eta time derivative of HXY. Plus terms which involve either two time derivatives or two powers of H. Okay. And I could find those terms by working harder, but I won't. Because I'm fundamentally lazy. Because you don't learn anything new from it for the current discussion. Okay. So that's a hydro calculation. And this is to be evaluated at some time t, which is when this h is living. Okay? And this h. Okay. Meanwhile, on the field theory side, what I want to know is the expectation value of txy at the time t. Well, let's trace e to the minus beta txy of t, uh-oh, this is an operator at some time which is different than the time that this e to the minus beta h is written. This I had better mean at t equals zero because that's the last time I actually know what I'm doing. That's my initial time when I have flat space and I know I'm in an equilibrium ensemble. Okay. So that's when I know what I'm doing. This is at a future time. And the time in between, I have some non-trivial evolution, not the usual evolution. Okay? And so I'd better write that explicitly as a time evolution operator. So here I need to have a u of t, the time evolution operator. And here I have to have a u of minus t, the anti-time evolution operator, where as usual, u of t is e to the minus i h t if h is constant. But it isn't, because my geometry is changing. And so I better be a little bit more careful and really write this thing out as the path integral expression, which it should be described in terms of. It's really an integral d whatever e to the i times the integral from 0 to t, integral d3x times my Lagrangian, ah, uh, be really careful, times root minus g times my Lagrangian, which is a function of my fields and my metric. Okay? So this thing is of t and h, and this is of minus t and h. The metric is involved in the time evolution. Okay. However, I'm only interested in the behavior at leading linear order in that metric. Okay. And so what I'm willing to do is to take a single metric derivative of this thing to find the linear in h behavior. Or I'm going to expand to first order, first sort of Taylor series in h. So let me write this in slightly more detail. So the question is going to be the following. So the full age dependence of this thing at linear order is an integral over time from 0 to t, I guess I call this t1, of hxy of t1 times the hxy of t1 dependence of u of t and h 
right? That's the usual thing if you were working to linear order in something. Is, is this okay? You know where, what the hell I'm doing? Uh, to find the linear term in something, you take its derivative and you multiply by the something. And if h were just a single number, then it would just take the derivative with respect to h and multiply by h. But h is some time varying thing, and so I integrate h and its derivative at that time. Okay? So that's, that's actually totally normal stuff. And what I have here is I have a path integral exp of i integral from 0 to t dt to d3x root minus g l. Okay? And this derivative This doesn't care, this doesn't care, this doesn't care. It acts here. Okay. So, how does minus GL depend on H? The definition of the variation of minus GL with respect to the metric is the stress tensor. So this is actually precisely one half TXY. This one half is annoying, but it's okay because what I forgot to mention is that there's a plus HYX derivative with respect to HYX because if I make HXY non-zero, I have to make HYX also non-zero with the same value. And this will contribute exactly the same thing canceling the half. Okay. And so what I get here, after I, so this is inside of an exponential, and so it gets pulled out of the exponential. And so what I get here is integral dt1, hxy of t1, i txy of t1, where by txy of t1, I mean that I still have the evolution operators here, u from t1 to 0, and u from t to t1 on either side there. So the rest of the time evolution is still there. If you want, this is txy in the interaction picture. The, the, no, in the Heisenberg picture. Okay? All the same statements I just made also apply over here, except this is an anti time evolution operator. <coughs> so this I have to continue on this board, which is exactly what I didn't want to have to do. Um, we need a fourth board. What do I do? You can... No. Why did nobody tell me? Okay, so where were we? We're almost out of time. That's where we were. So I have, you did this already, didn't you? No. I'm just repeating everything you said, except better. <laughs> so uh, my expectation value for txy at time t is, <laughs> now I have to flip the board. Back and forth. <laughs> yeah, well, we can do that too. So here we have <laughs> the evolution on one side, and here we have the evolution on the other side. This just means everything's a thermal expectation value. Okay? And so from here I get an integral from 0 to t dt1, and then I get trace e to the minus beta h so that it's a thermal expectation value. We expect. I guess there's a 1 <coughs> over z also. Um, and then we had a minus i h of t1 t of t1 t of t plus i h x, y, t of t, t of t1. 
This was from the forward time evolution, and this was from the backwards time evolution. And what they are is they're an i h x y of t1 times a commutator of t x y at t with t x y at t1. Expectation value in the thermal state. Okay. At No. No, this is an H, and then derivative with respect to H. Usual Taylor thing. It's all past influences of H, and the past influence is induced by a commutator. Notice also future influence of H is vanishing. This integral goes up to T. Now I can push this integral from minus infinity to plus infinity because H was zero before T equals zero. So who cares? And here I have to add a theta of T minus T1. And then that's all okay. So the thing that I actually care about is a commutator with a time ordering theta, or a, or a time specifying theta. And this combination is known as the retarded function of those two t's as a function of t and t1, okay? So the retarded function of t's integrated over time times h ought to be the same as this thing, okay? I now take both expressions and I stuff, shove them into the time domain, into the frequency domain. A time derivative on one side turns into a frequency derivative on the other side when I put those in the time in the frequency domain. Okay. So Txy of t is this field theoretical quantity in terms of a retarded function of stress tensors times h, or it's this quantity. So what I learn is that minus p plus minus eta i eta no okay so this has to equal this now I Fourier transform to frequency space and um, Should all be one variable. Okay, so after Fourier transforming, I find that p plus i omega eta should be the retarded function at omega, at least in the limit as omega gets small, so that I can stop at one derivative here. If I don't make omega small, I don't actually learn anything because then I don't have control over what I did here. Or if you prefer, eta is minus i times the frequency derivative of the retarded function of Txy with Txy as a function of omega at k equals zero in the limit as omega goes to zero. Okay? 
And I want to emphasize that the right way of thinking about this is a matching calculation. I set up some curved space environment, which allows me to start in equilibrium, get out of equilibrium in a controlled way, such that I have a non-vanishing shear flow. And then the coefficient on that shear flow is determined within field theory by a retarded correlation function of stress tensors. OK? And um, this is an equilibrium property telling you about non-equilibrium behavior. And that's called a fluctuation dissipation relation. Technically, this retarded function is not directly telling you about fluctuations in your system. In the next lecture, we'll see that there's something called a KMS relation, which I can use to convert this retarded function into a straight up correlator of the stress tensor at one time with the stress tensor at another time. And when we do that, what we'll learn is, well, the stress tensor just randomly fluctuates. Sometimes TXY just stops being zero because of thermal fluctuations. And then it relaxes back to being zero because of this. And how long it takes to relax back to zero is controlled by the shear viscosity. And so a correlation function like this, but without the commutators, actually tells you how strong the shear viscosity is, how fast random fluctuations get back to equilibrium. OK. And just as you can do this for the shear viscosity, you can do it for the bulk viscosity. For the bulk viscosity, replace TXY with TII minus 3 speed of sound squared T00. And up to factors of order or unity, the whole thing goes through. For the diffusion coefficient, which we mentioned there, you use the spatial component of the current. And because there can be correlators between two different currents, this can be a matrix. Um, and you don't have to stop there. You can actually extend this to h squared and higher time derivatives. And there was a nice paper by the Russian Austrian group where I treat you and Pavel as, and yeah. Son as Russian, yes. which is kind of a stretch. But Bayer probably was. Bayer's Austrian. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, where they laid out, okay, if you go to higher order, what are the additional coefficients which can appear here? And then there was a paper w by Kiyomars and me where we extend this treatment to second order in H's and in derivatives. And you can see how additional terms can all be matched. Um, let's see, was there anything else? I think I'm not only done, but over time. So maybe I should stop and take questions. I was about to stupidly ask you to open the window and let some cool air in here, and then I remembered. <laughs> Other? Yes? Can you remind me why you didn't consider the energy uh, that you said you were going to consider radius of the energy density? OK, so I'm going to appeal to things that um, Andre said in his lecture. Basically, when I set up this formalism and I allow that my system is not quite in equilibrium, I then have a choice. Exactly what do I mean by this epsilon? And exactly what do I mean by this u? Because in equilibrium, it's clear. And out of equilibrium, it's not clear. You have a little bit of freedom. And the answer turns out to be it's enough freedom that if you choose it carefully, then, OK, I guess the, the, the simple way of saying it is that at lowest order, this equation gives me a relationship between gradients of E and gradients of U. And I can use that relationship to exchange out any gradients of E in terms of gradients of U instead. And I can always write it using only the gradients of U. And because we want to write a not only simple but um, 
not only a simple description, but a description which doesn't have any hidden degeneracies in it, then it's a good idea to do that, to uh, reduce it to the minimum number of truly independent terms and only write them. Is this independent of the order? Or? At every order, you have to redo this game and figure out exactly what still needs to show up. By but I believe that you never need, maybe you can correct my ignorance, but I think that you can manage to arrange it that you never need derivatives of the energy density. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 If you allow full generality, um, charge densities, magnetic fields, uh, axial charge densities, vorticity, uh, gravitational fields, then at second order there are a lot of terms which can appear. And some extremely industrious people with names like Bhattacharya and, um, and uh, Loganayagam have actually exhaustively studied them and categorized them in terms of whether or not they create entropy and whether or not they're fundamentally thermodynamical and so forth. Other questions? Then it's coffee time, I think. <laughs>